Number 10, parties of poison. Hindsight is 2020, which I find more ironic than ever since the whole thing that happened and is continuing to happen. Today we know that lead, especially in large doses, is not good. It's poison. But a lot of the pipes that the Romans used in their plumbing were made from lead. Their water had 100 times more lead in it than the water that came from the springs, which means every time they drank water, they were poisoning themselves. Some side effects include behavioral changes as well as weakening organs and vital signs, etc., which may explain some of the more questionable emperor behaviors or the fall of the Roman Empire because people got nuts. But to add insult to injury, the Romans used to sweeten their wine with something called sapa. Sapa is lead acetate, the sugar of lead, which is, and it's also a salt, which is confusing, and therefore poison. Since Romans could down as much as two liters of wine in one sitting, they were slowly poisoning themselves, first with water, then with the wine. Speaking of wine, moving on to number nine, we have you better love wine. If you're a vodka or a beer person, you might not fit in while partying with the Romans, especially if you hate wine. Wine was the lifeblood of ancient Roman parties. Wine was drunk at every stage of the Roman party, but it had to be diluted with hot or cold water. Unlike how we drink wine today, which would be crazy if you were to dilute it. Whoa. It was looked down upon to drink wine in its purest form. It was served out with ladles, usually by naked and attractive male slaves. To heat the water, the Romans used special boilers, but if you really wanted to be bougie, they would add snow to make it cold. Considering they didn't have fridges back then, imagine the lengths they would have to go to to keep the snow cold. Beyond temperature, Romans absolutely drooled for calda and mulsum. Calda was great for cold nights, it was kind of like a mold wine, it was served hot and infused with spices. Molda was infused with honey and a lot sweeter. I want to try and make both. Maybe I will on my Instagram. Let me know if I should in the comments below. Minus the lead, of course. Number eight, seating charts. If you have ever been involved in a wedding, you know how important a seating chart is. Or like even in school, when you're like assigned desks, it's a big deal. You could end up sitting next to your uncomfortable cousin or beside your smelly Aunt Sue. It could determine whether the conversation blows or it's stagnant the entire night. Ugh, hate that. Romans understood the matchmaking game when it came to banquets. It was a pretty big deal. Where you sat determined your station and overall how liked you were. They had a three couch system called the triclinium. The most honored guests would sit on the couch in the center next to the hosts on the right. But if you were on the couch on the left, it kind of meant that you weren't as big of a deal. Sorry. Eventually as parties got bigger, so did the three couch rule extend to a huge semicircular couch in the middle that could hold about 12 people. Number seven, gladiator fights. We just did a video on this, Taylor and I, go check it out. Now, parties weren't just about eating, drinking, and socializing, there had to be entertainment, of course. Roman parties were designed around the five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. So of course there were the ancient Roman bards jamming out some earworms, but what was there to look at? You could only watch someone play the harp for so long. Next up on the entertainment list was acrobats, dancing girls, even mimes, which I was surprised to learn, plus trained exotic animals. If you were more like the charcuterie and like a quiet evening kind of person, you might enjoy poetry readings. But what really got the party started was an epic gladiatorial battle. Nothing like putting sharp objects in drunk people's hands. But that wasn't all they did. Parties were a big deal and nobles loved to outdo each other, so sometimes they went too far. More than once it got out of hand, but the most famous was during the reign of Emperor Elgabalus. He wanted to shower his dinner guests with flowers, so he built a full ceiling filled with them, but the flowers somehow ended up smothering some of his guests to death because he just kind of went overboard. Death by Roses. That's a poem title right there. Stick to poetry nights, my friends. Number six, Saturnalia. One of the most popular Roman festivals, it was kind of like an early Christmas celebration, kind of, except it wasn't at all. It was actually about the god Saturn, not Christ. Oops, but it did take place in December. December 17th, to be precise, for three days. But people loved it so much, it soon got extended to seven, a whole week. All work and businesses were suspended, so better do your shopping on the 16th. Slaves were even temporarily free to do as they pleased. Even moral restrictions were eased. A mock king was chosen, and candles, wax fruit, wax statues were all given as presents. The practice of candle giving was to symbolize the sun returning after the winter solstice. A statue of Saturn bound at the feet would be untied and invited to join the party. The houses were adorned with wreaths and greenery, kind of like Christmas, and singing, dancing, gambling were all common features. So kind 
kind of like Mardi Gras and Christmas combined. Number five, the Black Banquet. A prank that went down in history. Don't worry, this is nothing like GOT's red wedding. Thank goodness. Emperor Dominion had a pretty sick sense of humor and decided to host a party about it. In 90 AD, he invited a crowd of aristocrats to a banquet at Palatine Hill. When they arrived, the entire palace was decorated in black. Black velvet drapes, marble, everything was painted black like the Rolling Stones song. Even the food was black and everything was illuminated by funeral lamps. Naked serving boys were painted from head to toe in black paint and served food and drink to all the guests. When they sat down, their place marks were, were tombs with their names on it. And instead of lush couches, they sat on cement slabs. So basically he was like, yeah, sit in your own grave. Dominion had killed several senators in the past, so everyone believed that they were never gonna get out of there alive. It was like a huge metaphor for their own deaths. The emperor himself babbled about death and decay the entire night. So after the party was over and the guests made it home with their neck intact, Dominion sent gift baggies with their tombstones and onyx plates and a now clean serving boy ready to do their bidding. Turns out the whole thing was a prank and the emperor was back at the palace laughing his butt off. Number four, Bacchanalia. The party that was so wild it got banned. One word, orgies. The Romans dug that kind of kinky shindig but they like to pretend they didn't. Bacchanalia the back eye, is a term used to describe a drunken, debaucherous party at frat houses or sororities, which isn't far off from the heyday. The Bacchanal celebrates the god Dionysus, also known as Bacchus, literally the god of wine and a damn good time. The celebration could include massive feasts, ritual parades and performances, and people carrying clusters of grapes around, and of course, wine. Lots and lots of wine. It used to just be held by women three times a year, but soon men were slowly admitted to the festivities and they started making it happen about five times a month. But this was the breeding ground for scandal as it was rumored orgies and even human sacrifice occurred. So they were banned in 186 BCE and if you ban something, you'll only make it more popular so the celebrations continued covertly. So if you're into that kind of stuff, maybe forgo the human sacrifice, but there it is. Number three, power play party. I've never lived within the aristocracy. I'm a blue collar gal. I'm never gonna know what it's like to be that rich, but I'm pretty sure this kind of who can throw the bigger party mentality hasn't really changed. In ancient Rome, parties were an opportunity to show off the amount of power a nobleman had. As soon as guests arrived, the extravagance and the rarity of the food, the vessels with which they were presented were all judged as soon as they were seen. Wine goblets and jugs had to be functional yet exquisite, made from luxurious materials like gold, silver, and precious stones. Back then, a middle class family could afford silverware, so imagine what the nobles could do. This display of wealth played the long game, and it could mean political favors could be made down the road. So, sneaky, sneaky. Number two, Party Island. This is where it gets really dark. Ever sipped on a Capri Sun? Well, this story may taint that memory, so fair warning. The island of Capri became a rich retreat for the Roman aristocracy, known for its sadistic debauchery. Emperor Tiberius laid claim to this island as a haven for his horrendous and horrific, horrific behavior. He brought really young, too young male and female people of the night to serve him at his villa. The island became a kind of party place with absolutely no limits. From orgies in the caves to tormenting his servants on the rack as entertainment, Tiberius seemed to be the god Pan incarnate. In fact, he acted like it too. He made all of his participants slaves dress up as nymphs and goats while performing lewd acts. The island even became known as Goat Island with Tiberius being called the Old Goat. Ugh. Unless you enjoy dangerous games and gross parties, this definitely wasn't the party island fit for anyone. And last but not least, number one, Caligula. Caligula's parties, let's not go there. If you're a fan of Roman history, then you are familiar with the two most horrific emperors that ever were. One of them was Caligula. Though he started out pretty good, after an extreme bout of fever, his disposition entirely changed. Maybe it was because of the lead, we don't know. Many believed he was insane, as his cruelty knew no bounds, even when it came to joy occasions. Caligula's thing was that he liked to embarrass the wives of his officials for some reason and also his officials. He would force specifically married couples to his banquets and then steal the wives away throughout the night and then violate them against their wishes. But his torment doesn't end there. He would then relay to the entire party everything that he did in graphic detail and enjoy the frozen shock on everyone's faces because they couldn't do anything about it. It's no wonder he was eventually assassinated. Even at a party this guy knew 
knew how to kill the mood. He wasn't the only emperor to turn the dial on creepy, Tiberius, when the party started, but if you had to choose whose party to go to, this one plus Tiberius, both of them, just don't go near them. Go to another time frame. Just imagine it otherwise. Take you off the list at number 10. Field of the Cloth of Gold. 1520, King Henry VIII of England and King Francis I of France. They're talking, they're planning, and they figure what better way to nurture this relationship we have here, this working relationship with one another. Let's have a party, let's celebrate, why not? Two nations drinking together. What could go wrong, right? Well, this party lasted for two and a half weeks. Nobody really knew when or how to end it, but royals on both sides did know how to impress one another. And they did so by drinking more and more. And then they jousted in that order. Yeah, it was a horrible chain of events. They ate meat from over 4,000 lambs, 1,000 ox, you name it. They were pouring resources into this big party. All of their resources, in fact. And eventually the two lads just wrestled it out. Something they really just should have started with all along instead of involving others or their food supply. Yeah, both nations were completely drained of resources, food, treasury, you name it. Come 1521, they were at war all over again. Just one year later, but an absolute waste of time. But hey, they got to see two grown men wrestle, so. That's fun, I guess, in these times. Number nine, Festival of Drunkenness. Once upon a time in ancient Egypt, the big guy, Ra, god of the sun, heaven, kingship, power, and light, got upset with humanity and sent Hathor to teach us a lesson. She turned into a lion and began going around hunting humans, chasing us into the desert where she would drink our blood. Lovely. This made Ra feel a little bad, so he ordered his followers to bring him hematite and beer that he mixed together to make a blood-like liquid. Over 7,000 jars of the stuff. And he flooded the fields with it, which Hathor drank and drank and drank until she became so drunk she passed out. Because of Ra's decision to save us from the deity he sicked on us, the ancient Egyptians celebrated the festival of drunkenness. Basically, the people were allowed to drink, dance, do the deed, and light torches every 20th day of Toth at home or in temples with everyone else until they got so drunk that they passed out, just like Hathor. As far as excuses to drink and have massive parties go, this one's pretty solid, yeah. Number eight, the Red Wedding. January 28th, 1393, you are formally invited to a masquerade ball. Finally, it's about time. The French Queen Isabeau of Bavaria is hosting one of the most lavish parties of the decade. Bring your finest cracows, my friend. When the French royal court was celebrating the marriage of one of the queen's ladies in waiting, it was a big deal, it was a happy day. For some, it was the best day of their lives. For others, at this ball, not so great. Not such a great day. King Charles VI had five companions all perform a dance. A dance routine, how fun. Weddings have those, those are a good time. They did a performance as beasts. They were committed to the bit. They had masks, big baggy outfits, lots of linen, lots of stuffing to appear as if they were literal beasts. The party was going well, wine was spilling, beasts were roaring, it was a good time. But one rule was put into place before this party went underway. Absolutely, positively, no candles. Mm -mm. Obviously, right? I mean, look at these dudes. The Duke of Orleans had a little too much fun prior to this event and forgot the first rule of Fight Club when he arrived. The guy walked in with a lit torch. What an idiot. Some accounts say he dropped the torch by accident. Others say he got too close trying to guess the identity of these beasts. Either way, this was a tragic event that took the lives of four people. Hence the name Ball of the Burning Men. Number seven, Nero's Golden House. I couldn't imagine a worse time than not being able to leave a party when you want. I am famous for pulling an Irish goodbye and leaving without saying a word to anybody when my social battery reaches 0%. But that wouldn't fly at Nero's crazy parties. His Domus Ore, or Golden House, was where he held the craziest, heinous parties you ever did see. Massive feasts that they couldn't leave unless they ate enough to vomit or if and this is where it gets heinous, they did the dirty. Yes, the shika shika boom boom. According to legend, Nero would dress himself in animal skin and have men and women alike tied to posts where he would, well, you get the picture. People who went to these massive crazy parties were not allowed to leave until he said the party was over. See, Nero wasn't really known for being the most sane of Roman emperors, okay? Number six, Bacchanalia. If you've ever dreamt of joining an ancient Roman wine cult, well, the second century BC would have been a perfect time for you to be born. 
Sorry, you're just a tad late. I mean, now you get YouTube, but you're missing all this sticky goodness. We'll get him next time, Adam. Romans would gather in these cultic celebrations, all in the name of Bacchus, the wine god. These gatherings would be held in private, hopefully, or quiet areas of the woods. Again, hopefully. They would dance, they would cook food, they would eat, they would drink a lot, and then things would get rather intimate. They would dance a little closer with one another. Yeah, that was the whole point of this cult. You'd gather in small homes to dance the night away, if I can say that. Some accounts say people would often get poisoned in these ancient wine parties. It was pretty dangerous. It was like a dark theme, I guess. Ancient Romans just did that, I guess. So by the time 186 BC rolled around, the Roman Senate voted to end these cult gatherings. Rightfully so. Yeah, the smell alone, great call. Nobody did it like the Romans. Yuck. Number five, Feast of Fools. We have talked about this so many times, I have debated not including it on this list. But here we are. The Feast of Fools, where the lowest become the highest, at least in terms of religious officials. Every January 1st, starting in France and expanding to most of Europe, expect to see parades, comic performances, costumes, cross-dressing song, and lots and lots and lots and lots of drinking. There is a bit of debate on that point though. Apparently, at least in the church, it was a highly scripted and very formal event. But that's boring. We want to see Quasimodo hoisted up as the king of fools while people yell topsy-turvy. The more fun, non-religious application is as a relief from the depression-inducing rigors of daily life living in a society like that of medieval Europe. That sounds way better, right? Number four, Pleasures of the Enchanted Isle. Sounds like a Harry Potter sequel that didn't make it. it Harry Potter and the Pleasures of the Enchanted Isle. Don't bring your kids. What a name for a party. Okay, back in 1664, King Louis XIV decided to throw a big celebration for his mistress. Yeah, he told all invited that the party was for his mother, but really the spotlight was on his lady the entire time. What a dude. Already you're like, ugh, what a diva, classic. A week long party, I'd be out of there in three hours. I'd be yawning day one. Louis tried his best to keep the party going though, I'll give him that. He had outfits, a massive fake palace, he had a big float that looked like a whale, so those are fun. And he even had a ballet show. Yeah, nothing livens up a week long bender than a live ballet show in a room full of lanterns. Nice, now I'm definitely asleep. While setting off fireworks on day seven, the fake palace caught real fire. And at that point, everybody was like, yeah, we're gonna go home now, we must sleep. This is too much, I have a headache, I'm gonna throw up. Number three, banquet of chestnuts. Ah, the Borgia. We love an incredibly corrupt and hypocritical papal family. The innocently named banquet of chestnuts was a lovely way of showing us all just how hypocritical they were. On October 30th, 1501, an incredibly lavish party was thrown at the papal palace belonging to Cardinal Caesar Borgia, son of Pope Alexander IV, who both attended said party and had quite the time participating in it. Every member of the clergy was encouraged to take part and overindulge in all the finest foods, wines, and ladies of the evening that this uber wealthy family supplied. There was even rumored to be a massive, um, group activity that most, if not all, of the attendees took part in. What's with the chestnuts, though? The infamous party was named after the dancing ladies of the night picking up the chestnuts that were tossed at them by those sly and drooling clergymen. You dogs, you. It is debated whether or not this party was as lavish as we think. One, because the church tries its best to cover it up, and two, because the person who took record of it was Master of Ceremonies Liber Notarum Johann Burchard, who did not like the Borgia, but it was probably accurate. Number two, a lot of cheese. I love Super Bowl parties, but couldn't tell you one thing about football. I just go because my uncle makes this one dip, it's like a cheese dip, it's thick, it's liquidy. No idea how he makes it, no idea how he accomplishes such a task, but it's delicious. It's worth the commute every year. Sometimes cheese is just the life of the party and you have to accept that. Sometimes you're not a great host and cheese does all the heavy lifting. That's how life is. It's not about you, it's about your cheese. Cheese is better than all of us, okay? Hit that thumbs up for cheese today. Not us, not Big Ched, not me, just for cheese. Just cheddar cheese. 1837, President Andrew Jackson knew this. He was ahead of the game. He knew cheese was the main event. So during his last White House party, his big hurrah as president, he ordered a 1,500 pound brick of cheese to just be devoured. And then he invited 10,000 of his closest friends, hopefully who weren't you know, lactose intolerant, and went to town. If you're wondering how they got this cheese meteor to the White House from New York, well, they used 24 horses. And had to sit for two years before they opened the thing up. So you know for two years, guards were just standing there like, oh, 
I'm so hungry. I want a bite so bad. Should I do it? I'm gonna do it. The ball of cheese only took two hours to finally disappear, and then it returned moments later just in the form of gas and farts and horrible, horrible air. Number one, Viking Christmas. Yule, or Yule. It's the precursor to some of our modern Christmas traditions, just with a lot more drinking and ritual life-ending endeavors. We have no specific date for this one. I mean, it occurred, well we kinda do. It occurred every winter solstice and would last until the 12th day of January. Yes, that's 12 days of Viking partying, non-stop too. They had Yule trees just like our Christmas trees. There was a Yule wreath that was a giant wheel that they would set on fire and roll down a hill. Nice. They even had a Santa-like character, the Old Man Winter, who was invited to come drink with them, on foot or sometimes riding a horse. Very similar to Odin, actually. We know how the Vikings liked to party, too. In their giant mead halls, there would be massive feasts, dozens of roast poultry, horse, and beef, with enough beer, ale, mead, and fruit wines to sink a longboat. They had board games, dice games, and early forms of chess. They had ancient rap battles called flighting, which was basically who could insult the other one with the best rhyme. And obviously, they had drinking competitions. They sang, played instruments, had inebriated combat, recited poetry, and got very drunk for weeks on end. What more could you ask for? 